So I have the fun task of introducing our next panel. This is the health and climate panel, which focuses on how DSRP and the agent-based approach, which Matt just presented on, how they can both be used to approach health-based and climate-based wicked problems. So we have three fabulous students uh, on this panel. Claire and Michelle are both uh, second year MPA fellows and Gwen is a doctoral candidate in nutrition. The three of them will explore insights into the water programmatic gap in modern international development, equity in food and nutrition interventions and also leveraging the concept of One Health. Just as a reminder, this session will be made up of three 10 minute presentations and then followed by 15 minutes of Q&A which is moderated by one of my fabulous certificate students, Dan Starfars. So without further ado, I think we're starting with Claire. Yes, thank you so much, Laura. I'm just going to share my screen. All right, thank you so much, everyone. My name is Claire Lynch. I'm a master's in public administration student focusing on food systems, climate change, and sustainable agriculture. So today I'll be presenting my research and project on the climate adaptation gap within health, water, food, international development services, generally in the modern era from the 1990s forward. So we know that climate change is becoming more severe. We see the rate of hazards and disasters increasing in severity and occurrences. For the purpose of this presentation, we'll be focusing on high winds, drought, rainfall variability, wildfires, flooding, storms, and heat stress as the main hazards. However, the takeaways and learnings from this research are relevant across climate hazards, even if they're not included there. So the programs we've crafted historically to respond to poverty, to suffering and disaster are generally sorted into different categories. We have agricultural programs that focus on helping farmers produce more food on more adaptive food or more nutritious food. We have nutrition programs that sometimes give low income families food or cash or in-kind donations in order to supplement their existing diets. We have water and sanitation programs, which may include investing in infrastructure programs, in bringing in water, in helping reduce the rate of bacterial transmission within water sources. And we have health programs, which have really ranged, but can include disease prevention, treating disease, increasing health system capacity. And for the purpose of this presentation, water, sanitation, and health will be known as the WASH acronym. And so all of these programs are generally siloed. I have a silo here for everyone to see. Um, organizationally, each team works on one project. There is the agriculture team, there is the water team, there is the water emergency team. So all of these teams work separately. And my research in this presentation will delve into how climate change will affect the following areas, food, water, and health, and use the agent-based approach within systems thinking to understand how international development programming can better build resilience and enable a co collaboration in response to confounding risks of our upcoming environmental and human crises. So I'm gonna speak more about these confounding risks within my systems thinking map. So after taking the systems thinking class at Cornell, is able to delve into using this mapping software to look through the DSRP of the system. So the distinctions, the systems, the relationships, and the perspectives here. So you can start off on the left and see in the multicolored areas that we have this whole system of different hazards and they impact different consequences within these systems differently. So generally we have drought slash rainfall variability that may lead to reduced crop yields, but also to displacement. Storms may lead to decreased crop yields, displacement, and disrupted access to materials. And so we have all of these touch points connected by relationships that lead into malnutrition, disease transmission, respiratory, heat, vector, waterborne, um, to sanitation, and to medical care. And so to make this a little simpler, I'm going to break it down for one hazard, and that is flooding. And so using DR. DSRP within the larger system was really helpful for me in order to find the ways that these connect. But breaking it down into one hazard, I think, is a lot more clear. And so to start off, we have our flooding in the middle. 
This can be at a range of severities, but for the purpose of this, we're gonna say that it's a high severity flooding event. That can go into an increase in illness transmission, both vector-borne and waterborne, a decrease in crop yields, a decrease in livelihoods, and a disruption in access. But importantly, flooding leads not only directly to crop yields and livelihood impact, but the impact on crop yields can then go impact livelihoods. The impact on crop yields then go and impact nutrition, which then have a feedback loop with disease tr transmission. And so one of the biggest takeaways that I want you to have from all of these maps is that these risks are interrelated. Disease transmission doesn't live in a vacuum from supply chain, supply chain disruptions and malnutrition, but many of our programs and responses to these issues act as if they're individual, that they don't reverberate. And I want you to pay special attention to three central touch points. We have disruption and access to services and infrastructure, increase in illnesses and decrease in crop yields. And these three touch points impact each other and have a lot of feedback and re reverberations throughout. So next I'm gonna to move to POSAWID. The purpose of the system is what it does, the analysis. So our current international development program system works to respond to disasters and their impact on WASH is very reactionary. It's not necessarily something they prepare for or build capacity within. In the future, the development sector could design programs that build equity and system capacity to respond to disasters before they happen. So building up that community resilience, mitigating vulnerability in order to be better responsive to a disaster when it happens. Because like I started this presentation saying, we know that climate change is going to increase the rate of disasters. We need to be better prepared for them. So the difference between the current status of our system and the future status, um, the main differences are a short-term versus long-term mindset and funding structure, building capacity versus responding to disasters that focus change, and then being reactionary versus preventative. So these are going to build into the future recommendations. Um, this is just one type of analysis that will build into those recommendations. The second one is CAS, the for complex adaptive systems analysis, looking at three salient agents from this CAS. Um, there's a whole lot of them, but in order to be concise, I'm gonna focus on three. The first one is smallholder farmers. Their main rules are planting seeds, using climate smart inputs if it's convenient, affordable, or accessible, and generally planting staple crops because of the reliability and the accessible markets for those. And so staple crops could be wheat, they could be maize, they could be soybean, depends on where in the world you are. The second salient agent is going to be development agency personnel working in siloed work streams with program standards that are generally set by funders and foundations. And then we have medical professionals, the prioritization of patients with severe issues, reactionary treatment, and using whatever accessible tools there are. And finally, just to add in a fourth one, water system managers. So the level of capacity and investment in water systems is very dependent on the community and the resources within that community. And generally the system is taken for granted in areas where we have access to sanitation, to toilets, to showers, to clean water. It's something we don't think about until there are problems in it, whether that is from a lack of institutional support or a disaster. And so this all leads into my recommendation rubric. So I'm using all of these analyses, my DSRP mapping, the CAS analysis, the POSAWIT analysis to form in these recommendations for the sector. And I created this recommendation rubric because I wanted to make sure that none of my recommendations violated these terms. And so walking you through them, all of my recommendations I propose must account for direct and indirect impacts of climate change on health, water, agricultural system interventions. They have to include expansive goals and metrics for nutrition, wash, and climate adaptation measures, making sure we're not designing metrics that exclusively look at one component, but look at all of the components and impact of the sector. They have to be relevant across climate shocks in order to be localized and adaptable. They can't simply work for high winds. They also have to work for flooding and wildfires and drought. They must prioritize preventative system strengthening. They must offer localized options to specialize work to specific community concerns. And in discussions of risk, they must take into account the compounding and differ differentiated nature of climate risks on water health and agricultural systems. So kind of that compounding differentiated risk that we see within the maps, that was something I was able to take through my research and understanding that these problems don't exist in silos, so the responses need to work together as well. 
So the first recommendation looks at community resilience, creating programs that are geared towards instilling resilience in climate, public health, and wash systems for both indirect and direct impact of climate risks. Adding in climate adaptation considerations to existing programs. So this could look like making sure that if an organization is giving seeds out to farmers, that they are drought resistant, if that's a drought sensitive area. Making sure that if you're instituting a new intervention, it's one that is sensitive to local supply chains. So if there's a big climate disaster on the other side of the world that disrupts supply chains, that we can make sure this intervention continues with local resources. Focusing on the three central touch points we discussed earlier, crop yields, disease transmission, and disrupted access to resources, understanding how we can design interventions at those touch points and how they impact sectors rather than to be sector specific interventions. And then making sure that employees have expertise in all categories or are covered by a team with diverse expertise to make sure that employee expertise is not a limiting factor for implementing nexus wide interventions. Secondly, we have shifting disaster preparedness priorities. So integrating considerations of compounding risk on health and wash systems, disaster preparedness planning, understanding the snowball effect that damage in one area can have on the others. If disease transmission increases its impact on malnutrition and having those considerations in disaster planning rather than just in the response to disasters. Third one is investing in nonprofit government private sector partnerships focused on resilience around this nexus. We have many partnerships that are within sectors or focused on one issue, but investing in collaboration partnerships around this nexus is central to making sure that interventions are funded and capable. And then fourth, we have prioritizing collaboration between water system managers, medical professionals, and community members to prevent the spread of disease and illness. And so many of the salient agents, water system managers, doctors, they can work in private facilities or public facilities, but we know that collaboration on this nexus doesn't happen until the disaster happens. So making sure that the collaboration and those partnerships are formed beforehand as a disaster preparedness prevention measure. So we know that climate change is going to make our hazards more severe, more frequent, and more dangerous. The way that we can strengthen our systems and prevent these increasing threats from impacting all sectors of our society are by smart planning, planning that incorporates all sectors that are affected and understanding the risk of how they impact each other. And so I hope my presentation was interesting and helpful, and I look forward to any questions you have. This is the topic that I'm really interested in focusing my career around. And thank you so much for listening. All right, Gwen, you're up next. Getting there. There you go. Hey. <laughs> you all set? Yes, I am. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. I'm going to be speaking to you a little bit about opportunities for equity in food and nutrition research. I'm a first year PhD student in nutritional sciences with a focus on community nutrition. And so most of my work focuses specifically on the intervention components of nutrition. So today I'll be talking a little bit about the background of my project, the, six, the system thinking methods used to break that project down, and then some results relating to the case study I'm working on, the DRSP, or DRSP methods and actors and recommendations from the analysis of this system. And then we'll talk a little bit about the so what related to actually using this case study and thinking about it in a systematic way. So a little background. There is severe inequity in the food system. Um, interventions to address food justice typically take the form of scalable food education programs, policy development, structural environmental changes, and social assistance support like SNAP or WIC. When it comes to the scalability of foundational programs, um, local food interventions may be a meaningful case study for frameworks to disrupt and impact both research and intervention. 
I personally see farm to school as an intervention that is a localized and effective method for change, and it has been proven in the literature to be effective at changing both the food environment in the school and changing the nutritional intake of students in those settings. Specifically in settings where low income students rely on free or reduced school meals as reliable sources of food. However, there is also the compounding factor of low income communities experiencing trauma in relation to food and nutrition. Trauma can take the form of food insecurity in relation to food price, quality, nutritional value, acceptability, and availability. And there are also social and cultural influences that may affect trauma depending on an individual's background and their relation to food. There are new forms of intervention design and intervention practice coming forward that are focused on trauma-informed nutrition practices and concepts. These prioritize social and emotional needs and they recognize and address personal food experiences. School feeding programs often lack dietary diversity and fail to integrate food and nutrition education. And so full, uh, School food programs that opt for local purchasing may have the capacity to address the nutritional quality of foods, especially in settings where low-income students rely on those resources to eat. It may also empower hourly wage cafeteria workers and local farmers, and even introduce intercultural food learning in school settings. And schools that funnel resources and funding toward local procurement also has the capacity to increase local food system resiliency. So our wicked problem here in the farm to school programming that currently exists in the United States is that there is systematic exclusion, historically underrepresented perspectives and input from those who are disproportionately affected by food insecurity, specifically poor women and black indigenous and people of color are often excluded from the mainstream approaches of addressing food insecurity. As a result, farm to school planning and the implementation process is built to uphold these inequities in schools and in local food systems. And so with a potential systematic solution, as agents of change, low income women and BIPOC individuals may ensure that food and nutrition interventions are rooted in real world evidence that can adapt to population needs when they are involved in the actual planning and implementation process. And this picture here is actually of Fannie Lou Hamer. She is from Mississippi. She was actually one of the first women to enact a farm to school program in all of the United States. And so this type of practice is actually rooted in poor black women. And so with systematic solution, there may be potentiality to have farm to school address food insecurity, address food and nutrition traumas and guide individual and group empowerment in school food environments, especially among low income students who experience food insecurity and hourly wage workers who work in the food um, preparation setting. There's also an opportunity to systematically integrate cross-cultural sharing through menu development and food learning, culturally competent and trauma-informed food options and curricula, and dietary diversity and food representation. When it comes to the specific case study that I was focusing on, this is the Vermont feed framework. I'll orient you to the way that the, the framework functions through this map. Um, the framework first works with schools to build coalitions, then plan their farm to school interventions, act or implement those actual uh, changes that have been planned, and then systematically adapt every single year in a feedback loop to ensure that the program is actually working. However, in this um, assessment of the case study, we're actually just going to be looking at the process of building coalitions in the school and community setting and the process of actually doing the planning prior to farm to school implementation. 
So when we actually dig a little bit further into the building and planning components, there are so many parts that have systems within systems. You'll see that there are some that focus specifically on the recruitment process, the actual act of listening and learning about people's food experiences, and then the development of goals and intentions for prioritization of certain intervention components. You also note that there are some red boxes. These red boxes have been indicated in this color because they are opportunities for potential intervention further down the line when we're thinking about recommendations for increasing equity and the voices of marginalized folks. I also wanted to show that there is an entire component completely separate from what we perceive as the case study of the Vermont food environment. And this is the perspective of evaluation or evaluators. So I myself have worked in evaluation for food and nutrition intervention programming and see where there may also be an opportunity for these systems to integrate equity and the voices of the individuals who are actually being impacted and whose changes are being measured during interventions. So when looking at the POSAWID or the purpose of the current system of farm to school building and planning in school settings, we have a handful of simple rules that are conducted by agents. All of these agents are individuals who work either in or who are implement or, uh, uh, included in the um, food system of a local community or a school district community. They currently work in ways where they ensure that basic needs are met, but they tend to limit engagement and have lack of transparency. Whereas, uh, and they also withhold personal experiences, which leads to a lack of change and a very simple, straightforward way of implementing farm to school that doesn't necessarily address nor recognize personal experiences or personal traumas related to food. And so what is missing from this current system? It is the recognition of demographic and lived experiences, which is also known as positionality. So this can be the, the demographic intersectionality of someone's gender, their race, their ethnicity, or their socioeconomic status, which interplay off of each other and, have the, and has the capacity to impact both lived experiences with food and what influences uh, employer expectations and power dynamics in the work environment. And when you combine all of these into an, an, an environment of school and school planning, this can determine who and how individuals actually engage in the into the farm to school planning process. So the current system makes simple changes to the school food system and evaluation does not assess for food trauma or inequity. Whereas in the future, there is capacity for these farm to school interventions to center marginalized experiences and focus on trauma informed care that leads to structurally disruptive and observable changes in the school food system. The root difference of this being that the current system does not see oppression and sees food as a privilege, whereas with this root difference, there is capacity and possibility to see oppression as someone's lived experience in the food system and to recognize food as a human right. When it comes to actually recommending uh, changes for enacting uh, farm to school, the rubric developed for my recommendations focus, focuses specifically on these five criteria. So these five criteria are kind of like a litmus test or a guiding light for potential recommendations that may de be developed simply because farm to school is so individual to each individual school district and community that the school serves. But these uh, recommendations must focus on farm to school interventions and planning processes that are culturally sen sensitive, holistically trauma-informed, that decenter white or privileged narratives around food and farming. They extend beyond the school setting and engage underrepresented communities and support them in the process of either local procurement or engaging them in the food and menu planning process at the school. And then it also must be a program that can be evaluated to ensure that the program is doing what it can and doing what it should. And so a little bit of a recap. In this so what question, we understand that farm to school is a feasible intervention that has the capacity to address childhood nutrition security and 
increase local food system resiliency. But farm to school planning has its pitfalls. But with DSRP, we have the ability to unpack the process of coalition building, planning, and evaluation as it exists today. And by conducting this unpacking process and mapping the current system, understanding the possible, we can identify specific group differences of what is and what could be so that schools have the ability to create environments and communities that are trauma-informed, uplift underrepresented, re underrepresented voices, and see food as a human right rather than a privilege. Thank you. I welcome your uh, questions, comments, and conversation that may come of this. Great. And next, we're going to hear from Michelle Parks. Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Michelle Parks. I am a second year MBA student, and I'm also in the certificate program. Um, and my presentation today is called Leveraging One Health, a case study using the agent-based approach. So this is my map. And in addition to a 16 page paper, um, it's the product of a semester's long research project in the systems thinking course. Um, it's pretty big. And um, you can, if you are interested in what I'm saying today, my paper will be published in the Journal of Systems Thinking. And I encourage you to look at it for um, a deeper analysis of what has essentially been my thinking about this concept. So for my paper, um, I was interested. Uh, Michelle, in... sorry, uh, but it doesn't appear that your screen share is working there. Oh. Um, let's try again. Sorry, y'all. No worries. There you go. I missed okay. the most important thing. No. So you just, yeah, there you go. It's perfect. All right, y'all. Okay, well, here's my map. <laughs> um, so it's very big and it's very um, detailed. And again, my paper will be published in the Journal of Systems Thinking. So um, this is the topic of interest. And so for my project, I was interested in the concept of One Health and how it may be relevant to adaptation efforts in the United States to address climate change. So One Health is a philosophy rooted in the field of veterinary medicine, and it has had a lot of buzz about its potential, but it's been slow moving with its application in human health initiatives. So the overarching goal of One Health is to produce optimal health outcomes, and this is achieved through recognizing the interrelationships between animals, humans, and the environment, and that the optimal health of one group is reliant on the health of others. And so when discussing climate change, One Health is a very relevant concept. Climate change's impacts on health are direct and indirect, and it affects humans, the environment, and animals. And this issue is very complex, and its complexity may add to people's confusion over how to conceive the crisis. And this ultimately impedes our ability to take adaptive uh, measures at the necessary scale. And so framing climate change through a health perspective may be a way to overcome this gap. And in fact, research has found that Americans are more receptive to information and mitigation policies about climate change when they are framed based on health impacts. And so with this information, I wanted to apply systems thinking to understand the relationship between One Health and climate change. And so this is um, the line, and this line marks the threshold in a complex adaptive system. And when you go above this line, um, there are emergent properties and dynamics are very complex and you have little influence or control. Below this line, you have maximum control and effect, and it's below the line where there are agents that abide by simple rules. And so climate change is a complex adaptive system, but what are its key agents and simple rules? So climate change is the result of um, Global warming caused by a human behavior that's emitted greenhouse gases. And so therefore it's very clear that we as humans are the key agents of this system, but what are the simple rules we follow? Through the DSRP mapping process, I identified a simple rule and that is that as humans, we exist in nature. Whether we are in the woods or moving from a car into our office in a busy city, 
we are exposed to the environment and thus as humans, we are always interacting with and being shaped by the environment around us. Based on my map, a structural prediction was made and that is that human nature connection is a mediator between One Health and climate change. By leveraging the One Health perspective, which implies that our health is connected to the health of animals and the environment, we can improve our connection to nature, which may lead to more sustainable behaviors and ultimately affect climate change. Sustainability discourse calls for humans to have a stronger connection with, the, with nature because our progress is linked to the stewardship of a planet. But over time as a society, we have increasingly distanced ourselves from this fundamental aspect of our reality. As a result, the current state of human nature connection is marked by imbalance and disconnection. Using the tools and concepts from systems thinking, this is the part in my DSRP map where I did a POSWID analysis of human nature connection. Um, to review, POSWID is the point of the system is what it does. And so the current POSWID of human nature connection is that humans connect to nature through dominating resources, which creates an imbalance that threatens the environment. The ideal POSWID is that humans are connected to nature through recognizing the symbiotic relationship we have with the environment. This creates balance and encourages sustainable behaviors. I propose that one, a One Health-based intervention that is designed to help people recognize the inextricable link between human health and environmental health will lead to this future pause win. In this state, connection outweighs disconnection and our relationship with nature is balanced. One Health can facilitate this future positive as the concept is inherently intersectoral, capturing how our individual health is dependent on health of systems outside of the human body. And so before discussing the intervention I propose, I wanna address these recommendation rules. These rules, um, by establishing foundational rules prior to making my recommendation, um, this is an aspect of the agent-based approach. And this is to ensure that if your recommendations change, whatever new recommendations you make, they'll always be grounded in these foundational principles. And so I suggest that no recommendation perpetuate an imbalance of human nature connection. They must see systems relationships, be easily understood, have no barriers to access, and they must be routinely revisited. And so with these rules, my proposed intervention is to frame adolescent health education curriculum in the United States through the One Health perspective. With humans as key agents, I focus on adolescents as they are at an age in which they are incredibly impressionable. And as they grow older, the impacts of climate change will worsen and climate adaptation will be the norm. In the United States, although it is very politicized, when, have, when health education is offered, it is typically in a class in which students from all levels are in the classroom together. This increases the ability of this intervention to be accessed by all students. Another recommendation is that this intervention is somewhat context specific. People live in different places and can have different perspectives of what nature is. Access to natural environments or wilderness is not readily available, and that idea that being in wilderness is the only way to connect to nature is flawed. So it is important that curriculum is designed to facilitate an understanding that wherever you are, you are connected to nature, and that this connection influences not only your own health, but the health of the environment and animals. And so as we reflect on this complex adaptive system, it is interesting to wonder what emergent properties may result from a generation of people with a deeper connection to nature. By teaching adolescents about health through a One Health perspective, we can provide them with the tools to feel more connected to their environment. This may help them understand, adapt, and cope with the threats of climate change. As adults, we must, have, we must take a moment to ask ourselves, what kind of world are we leaving behind and what can we do now to reduce the burdens for future generations? Unfortunately, it is also at this moment that the education system in the United States is under attack from underfunding, mass violence, and policies that are designed to prevent critical thinking. And so what are the tools we are giving young people to cope with their complex reality? 
I would argue that improving our connection to nature through recognizing that the health of ourselves is dependent on the health of the environment and animals may have a positive impact on climate change and lead to a world characterized by connection and balance. So, thanks. Thank you, everyone. Those were some very interesting presentations there. Um, Gwen, I did see you raised your hand there for a moment. Do you uh, have a question, perhaps, or was, go ahead. That was a mistake. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. No problem. Um, so this is a, this is a question for all of you, but um, how do you feel like the DSRP mapping process helped you come to your specific recommendations? Um, whoever wants to go first, go right ahead. I can start off. Sure. Um, so I actually did and started my research as a part of an internship that I did for Care International for the last year. And my first kind of brief I was given was to look at the connections between climate change, health and water. And I think working on the DSRP mapping really helped me kind of see beyond the initial like how do winds affect health systems? How does fire impact water security? Kind of those initial questions and then look deeper to the themes that are relevant here. So how does in general, the instability caused by disasters impact these systems rather than first and foremost, I think I was thinking more hazard specific, but through the process of using the DSRP mapping, it allowed me to see past the kind of initial first level there and then see deeper into the themes that were really relevant for understanding um, how to build resilience in systems in a way that is relevant to all of these sectors and isn't just sector specific or hazard specific. Absolutely, yeah, it, it helps with the multi multidisciplinary approach. Um, one thing that you had mentioned in your uh, uh, presentation, Claire, was the issue with siloing between different departments. Um, do, you do you feel like uh, systems thinking, I mean, obviously system thinking was used to help you come to your conclusions, but do you think it can also be used by the agents themselves to address that siloing issue? And, and how would you envision that happening, if so? Definitely. Um, I mean, systems thinking is a set of tools. And so I think Laura and Derek, through their work, have shown that you can use it with first graders, you can use it with heads of CEO Fortune 500 companies, it's accessible to many different people once you get past the first level of the language and the tools. Um, I think the most important part is kind of reframing the priorities here. And so reframing how we respond and fund disaster emergency programming, um, whether or not it could be used, I think, um, there's a certain level of getting past that language of learning the analyses and having that training, but I definitely think it, it can be useful in terms of seeing your role a part of the larger system and understanding where the, there can be um, new collaboration and new work done as well. Okay, yeah. Um, Gwen, I had a uh, question for you as well. Um, I'm curious as to what some of your recommendations would look like in practice. Sure. So the reason I didn't actually present any of the recommendations that I had drafted um, was mostly because it can differ so aggressively from one school district to the next. A school district in upstate New York is going to look much different than a school in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. And so when it comes to things like cultural sensitivity and trauma-informed nutrition practices, uh, the recommendations in an upstate New York school may focus more so on the experiences of individuals who are from um, poor white communities, whereas in, for example, downtown Atlanta, it would have to focus more so on the experiences of those who have lived, who have lived through racism and through oppression in relation to urban food systems and food insecurity in places where um, the excess access to green space and access to fresh uh, fruits and vegetables is far more limited, both structurally and economically. And so when it comes to um, some of the recommendations that like I specifically wrote, the first one was mostly prioritizing that individuals who are seen as marginalized communities 
within a greater community. So poor women who are eligible for SNAP or WIC, um, Black and Indigenous community leaders are actually involved in the school planning process. So they are brought into community meetings, they are brought into um, school board meetings, and they are actually asked what their needs are in the process of engaging and planning for farm to school practices to make sure that their needs are met and their families' needs are met since it's their children who are attending these schools. Right, absolutely, yeah. Um, Michelle, um, I was curious as to why you proposed um, teaching this one health plan as a health class rather than a science class. Could you elaborate on that a bit? Um, yes, so I thought about health class rather than science class because um, it's a matter of like access. Um, I think when we limit the idea that you know, especially with thinking about climate change, when we're only teaching it in a scientific way, it kind of creates silos, how we're talking, um, silos and health education is very much an accessible um, class. When it is offered though, I really do want to articulate that in the United States, um, the health education landscape is very different. Um, and so this intervention and expanding our perspective of health um, of health could really um, kind of expand how we teach it, you know, rather than focusing just on the individual, we kind of can step outside of the anthropocentric lens and think about how our health is connected to the health of animals and the environment, so. Yeah, uh, one thing that I thought was quite interesting about your presentation was your proposal that based on geography or other factors, the, uh, the curriculum is probably gonna look a lot different based on uh, folks' perspectives of their own environment. Um, how do you see uh, when we all have to, you know, because we all have to kind of have a similar consensus on policies and things in order to get them implemented. How do you see folks reconciling their different perspectives based on their backgrounds? Um, do, you, do you kind of see system thinking or any other tools being utilized to kind of help people understand the, these differences? For sure. I mean, systems thinking is like the principles of it is a really good bridge for connecting different um, systems and perspectives. Like if you were coming from a health background or a science background, um, I think rooting yourself in systems thinking principles can help you see those relationships between the two. Um, and also, I think the the agent based approach is also a very good framework um, because you start off with DSRP and you're making sense of the mental model of like you're mapping out the system and then you're giving the tools and you're making these recommendations, this recommendation rubric, um, and kind of like grounding what other what other future suggestion, suggestions you would make. Um, and huge crucial aspect of systems thinking is recognizing like adaptivity um, because the solutions and that we make, they do have to be adaptive because our world is VUCA. It's volatile, uncertain, complex, and adaptive. And so grounding ourselves in the principles of systems thinking, knowing the agent-based approach is a very useful thing. Thank you, yeah. Um, getting back to siloing here, I had an interesting question from the audience. Um, I suppose this could apply to all of you. Um, we're interested in learning how these solutions can help to break down silos um, with collaboration. Um, what are the main obstacles you see in addressing these silos uh, and how do you see them being resolved through systems thinking or your recommendations and your recommendations? I can go for it. Um, so I think it really comes down to institutional priorities and funding, making sure that uh, the structure that we're looking at, whether or not it is a nonprofit, whether or not it is the sector, incentivizes that sort of collaboration and work. We all know that um, work only happens when there's funding and when there's money to go towards it. And so if we don't have funding and personnel and a structure that enables that sort of collaboration, that incentivizes it and prioritizes that sort of work, it won't happen. People are simply too busy. They have too much going on. And so I think these are the types of decisions that really need to be made from a strategy level at the top of an organization to carry down to incentivize that change. And while it's incredibly important that staff members and 
community members are on board and that it's not kind of top down hegemony, but making sure that the resources are there to support the people who are going to be doing this more expansive work um, is important because otherwise we we won't have it. Very true, yeah. Um, uh, here's one I have is, you all, I'm sure you all came into these issues uh, with your own uh, preconceived notions. How did DSRP kind of did, if at all, if at all, did it change your perspective of how you think of, of these things, these issues, and what do you think was kind of the most striking thing that systems thinking and DSRP did to change your understanding of the issue? Uh, Gwen, how about I volunteer? Yeah, I can go. Um, so I think for me, I'm working with a case study where a lot of the systems mapping was actually just unpacking how these types of interventions are currently developed and how they're rolled out, especially through like the lens of a framework. I was using a very specific framework that is used nationwide and is pretty much like the cornerstone for developing farm to school interventions. And for me, the process of mapping allowed me to actually see where there has there is potential for change. I think a lot of times we think of change in these types of interventions as something that is like a full overhaul and a complete redirection of these types of programs, especially the frameworks of them. However, when it comes to working with schools and working with really underfunded public programming, we have to start small and we have to start with the people who are already there doing the work. And so being able to pinpoint small parts of a system that already exists to see where there could be more theoretical change in who's engaged and what we're saying during that process of engagement, I think has more meaningful impact in the long run in how those frameworks are actually used and who gets to be engaged in the process of developing and carrying out these programs and what that may mean for the young students who are eating the food and seeing themselves reflected in the food that they're served on a daily basis or actually learning in the classroom and seeing the opportunities that they may have in relation to um, exposure to green environment and exposure to nutritional learning um, that may affect the way that they eat and the way they think about food for the longer term. Thank you. Yeah, I was I was also a big fan of the mapping process. I felt like it was an excellent tool to kind of help you ver almost verbalize uh, your own understanding. Um, I certainly found it to be a great aid. Yeah. So I'm going to thank you, Dan, for moderating such a fascinating session. As always, we could probably talk another hour maybe more, because it's always so interesting and you all have such a dynamic set of things that you're talking about that are separate, but also obviously related. Um, so thank you, uh, Claire, Gwen, and Michelle for your great presentations and Dan for moderating.